Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm going to read an article to you by T. Austin Sparks from the online library of T. Austin Sparks. It's a great article. Uh, actually, it's two chapters, okay, so stick with us on this. It's called, What is a Christian? Okay, chapter 1. And Agrippa said unto Paul, With but little persuasion thou wouldest fain make me a Christian. Acts 26, 28. Let us say at the outset that we are using the word Christian strictly according to what is found in the New Testament. And it is assumed that this will be accepted. Our inquiry will take the form, firstly, of a process of elimination. And we shall observe what a Christian is not. 1. To become a Christian is not to become religious or to adopt a new religion. Among non-Christian peoples, a turning to Christ is often referred to as accepting Christianity. And in what are called Christian countries, conversion is frequent, frequently referred to as be, becoming religious. Such expressions with their associated ideas are altogether inadequate and indeed fundamentally false. There was no more religious man on the earth in his time than Saul of Tarsus. Read what he says of himself in Acts 22 and 26 and Philippians 3. Here was a man who was just aflame with religious zeal and passion. No argument is necessary with history before us to prove how wide of the mark religion can be. And that is true of Christianity, when it is merely a matter of religion. To be a true Christian is not to accept a creed or statement of doctrine, to observe certain rites and ordinances, attend certain services and functions, and conform more or less diligently to a prescribed manner of life. All this may be carried very far, with very many good works. But those concerned may still be outside the true New Testament category of Christian. Herein lies the danger of an assumed acceptance with God, which may bring that bitter disillusionment foretold by our Lord Himself in those startling words, quote, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not by thy name do many mighty works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me. Matthew 7, 23 and 24. No, religion is not Christianity, either more or less. It may be only deception. So that when we seek that people should become Christians, we are not asking them to change their religion, nor are we asking them to become religious. Religion as such has never made this world happier or better. Two, to become a Christian is not to join an institution called the church. If the truth were known, there is no such thing as joining the Christian church. We never took any steps, either of word or deed, in order to get our limbs to become members of our bodies. There is no distinction between our members and our bodies. Our members comprise our bodies, but they do so not by organization, invitation, examination, interrogation, or catechism, but simply by life. You get that? Praise God. So, in the Church of Christ, provided that a true life relationship exists, a, quote, membership, end quote, in the technical sense, is a superfluity and may be a menace. If there is not that relationship, then no, quote, membership, end quote, can constitute the Church of Christ. There are multitudes, we fear, who have membership 
in what is called the quote church end quote, who are not able to stand up to the test which will be presented when we come to speak of what a Christian is but let us say here that when we appeal to people to become Christians we are not asking them to join the church and it must be realized that Christianity is not just one more institution of society you may go to many places called quote churches end quote and never really meet Christ or find satisfaction of course that is negative we must realize however that when we become Christians we share one new life in Christ with all other born-again believers and thus we become one in Christ that really is the church it is for us then to cherish that relationship and jealously watch over its sacredness there are immense values in it number three to become a Christian is not to become a part of a new movement it is true that there is a sense in which Christianity is a movement a divine movement from heaven but there are very many who conceive of Christianity in terms of a great enterprise for world betterment or even evangelization the appeal is so often made that people will come and associate themselves with this great work quote unquote there is that in most people which makes a response to such an appeal and would like to be in a great movement but such a way of approach is to court trouble or at least to be found sooner or later in a false position Moses got the movement idea in Egypt and then had 40 years in action in the desert there is that which comes before the quote movement end quote and the movement is with God not with us praise God the greatest value in movement when God's time comes for it often is that we have learned not to move without him hallelujah we do not appeal to you to join a movement we do not invite you saying quote here is something into which you can throw all your natural powers and youthful enthusiasm end quote we would say quote God has a purpose you are of concern to him in relation to that purpose but you cannot even know or enter into that purpose until something has happened in you which has made you another person in that purpose you will need much more than natural powers and youthful enthusiasm that brings us to the positive side now listen very closely what a Christian is in seeking to show what a Christian really is we can do no better than take the case of one who not only was a great instance himself but whose experience has been that of every true Christian since we refer to the one who was addressed by a Roman king in the words at the head of this chapter the Apostle Paul while the method of his conversion may not be the usual or general one the principles are always the same here then are the first three principles and realities of a true Christian life one number one who art thou I am Jesus the first thing is the inward realization that Jesus is not was a living person hallelujah 
The very first words of Paul when confronted by Christ were, Who art thou? To which the answer came clear and strong, I am Jesus. It was a startling dis discovery, and Paul might well have exclaimed, What? Jesus? Alive? Jesus had been put to death, crucified. All that remained to do was to blot out the memory of him and destroy what represented him. To this work Paul, then Saul, had committed himself. We can hardly imagine, then, what a startling and paralyzing thing it was to be confronted with the fact that Jesus was not dead, but alive and in glory. And not only with the fact, but with the person himself. Hallelujah. All that this implied and involved has been the teaching of many centuries since. But for those to whom these present lines are addressed, this can be resolved into a very simple matter. We begin our Christian life by an experience of this living reality. Not a Jesus of history, but a Jesus of heart experience that he really is alive is the one thing which is open to be proved by us. And it is the most serious matter as to our eternal destiny. We have only to drop our traditions, our prejudices, our suspicions, our questions, our mental problems, and quietly kneeling speak to him, although unseen, as we would speak to one whom we could see telling him out of the honesty of our heart what we would tell him if we were face to face. The first step is definitely to speak to him as to a person. This is the way of a discovery. We learn from the New Testament that the Spirit of God is abroad and in the world just to bring about this discovery, to make real that Jesus lives to save and be our very life. This wonderful realization that Jesus lives comes to the heart of everyone who honestly turns and puts it to the test. And everything springs out of that. There is only one way, really, of knowing Jesus, and that is by coming to Him. It may seem very unreal and foolish to say something to someone of whose existence you have no inward proof. But might this not be the same in other circumstances? You have heard of a physician. What you have heard makes you feel that he is just the man for your case. Will you say that you don't believe that there is such a person? Will you say that there is plenty of evidence available that he was killed some time ago? Will you go as far as going to his house and seeing the man spoken of and then telling the man that you don't believe that he is the physician? If you will do this, then either your case is not very serious, or you are refu refusing to admit its seriousness. If you are really alive to your need, the very least that you will do <coughs> will be to go to the physician. Tell him your trouble and say, I am advised that you can meet my need, and I ask you to do so. My coming to you represents an honesty in honest inquiry and committal, in spite of many doubts and questions. My friend Jesus Christ was ever ready to make the desired gesture to an approach like that. The discovery that Christ is a living reality is the first thing in a Christian life. This is a test as well as a testimony. The second thing, what wilt thou have me to do, Lord? In Paul's case, as in every true Christian life, is represented by one sentence. What wilt thou have me to do? Acts 22.10 This represents a new position and a new relationship. How very different from that of the old Saul. Hitherto his life and activity had been out from himself. That what he thought he would do, what he proposed, purposed, planned, determined, and desired, self-determination had been his way of life, although he would have said that it was done in a good cause, even done for God. What an example Saul was 
of the fact that a man's very best intentions and devotions and what he believes to be his God's interests may yet be doing God the greatest disservice and he himself be totally blind to the fact. We shall speak of this again later. Chapter 2, Section 2 We see here then that one thing is a clear evidence of a life truly acceptable to God. It is the absolute Lordship of Jesus Christ. Paul first used that word Lord at his conversion. It came out spontaneously when he realized that Jesus lives. From that moment Jesus was his Lord, his Master. We know from his life afterward how utter was that surrender and change of government. Everything from that hour was on the basis of what wilt thou. Yes, it is the hall, the hallmark of a true Christian life when, with the same inward realization and abandonment, we say to Jesus, Lord, and thenceforth have our whole lives governed by Him as Master. Number three, Christ in you. There is one more indispensable mark and feature of the Christian life to which we will point at this time. It is shown in the words addressed by, to Paul by one Ananias. The Lord Jesus has sent me that thou mayest be filled with the Holy Spirit. Acts 9.17 The consummation of this basic work by which we become Christians in the true sense is that everything which is true of Christ is made an inward thing with us hear that? The consummation of this basic work by which we become Christians in the true sense is that everything which is true of Christ is made an inward thing with us. Up to this point, although everything has been very real and deep changes have taken place, it has been mainly as an outward relationship with Christ. But it would have been fatal to have left it there. However great the discovery, we cannot live upon something which happened at a certain time. We cannot meet all the tremendous forces of evil which will oppose us in, in the strength of a mere memory. However vivid, we shall never live triumphantly or serve effectively or satisfy God truly on any basis of what is merely outward and objective, the fact is that only Christ can really satisfy God. Only Christ can really satisfy God. Only Christ can do God's will and God's work. Only Christ can overcome the spiritual forces of evil. Yes, only Christ can really live the Christian life. Hence, the one great inclusive and crowning reality of a Christian is Christ himself within. Paul later put this in these words, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27 This becomes true by a definite act when we believe the Holy Spirit takes possession of us in an inward way. This indwelling of Christ had never been known by any man in history until Christ had died and risen and been glorified. It is therefore the peculiar wonder and glory of the Christian. It is this very thing that explains the New Testament term born anew. There was nothing like it before. So then, in a word, our question, what is a Christian, is answered in three initial things. One, number one, realizing that Jesus is alive, enthroning Him as absolute Lord, number two. Number three, having Him as an inward presence and power by the Holy Spirit. The testimony of a true Christian must ever be, He lives, He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He talks with me. Along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know He lives. He lives within my heart. Oh, hallelujah.
What is a Christian? By T. Austin Sparks, Chapter 2. Thou wouldest fain make me a Christian. Acts 26, 28. I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Acts 26, 14. The above words spoken to the same man, Saul of Tarsus, later Paul the Apostle. In the first case by a ruler under the Roman Empire. In the second case by Jesus of Nazareth. Contained the essentials of a true Christian experience. This Paul was a truly typical Christian, both in the way in which he became one and in his life as one. While there may not be many who become Christians with the same form or accompaniments of their conversion, we may not have been smitten to the ground by a blinding light as we went on some journey and heard an audible voice from heaven calling us by name. Yet the principles are always the same. Let us look into these words for the principles. Something absolutely, number one, this is number one, something absolutely personal. Quote, I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul, end quote. There were others traveling with Saul on that day. How many? We do not know. Paul speaks of them as all. When we were all fallen to the ground. End quote. It would seem that there were quite a number, but Saul was singled out. And what happened was so directly personal that it was as though he were the only man on the earth. He ever afterwards spoke of his experience as something extremely personal. The amazing thing to him was that Christ knew him by name and knew all that was going on inside him. It is a fact and a fact which we must realize that God has a personal and direct interest in us and a very personal concern for us. Aren't you glad? I'm glad. The writer had a friend who visited military the writer, now this is so cool, okay? Listen to this. This is how personal God is, okay? This is how much God cares about you, okay? God cares about you. God loves you. But God hates sin, okay? Now you listen, okay? Hallelujah. Now this is... Uh, this is, once again, this is an article, What is a Christian? by T. Austin Sparks. Now, he's going to tell this story, okay? He's talking about that. The amazing thing to Paul, the amazing thing to him was that Christ knew him by name. Oh, hallelujah. And knew all that was going on inside him. See, God knows your name. And he knows what's going on in you today. And God loves you so. He wants you to come to Him and believe the Gospel. And then He will give you that change, that, that repentance. You do it. You will not go wrong. Hallelujah. It is a fact and a fact which we must realize that God has a personal and direct interest in us. And a very personal concern for us. The writer talking about himself now, T. Austin Sparks, had a friend who visited military hospitals. Check this out. He always carried in his pocket some texts to leave with men who might be in need of a little bit of God's Word. Before starting out, he used to pray that he might be guided to give the right text to the right man. On one of these visits, when entering a ward, he looked around and up in the corner was a bed with a form bandaged so completely that only nose, mouth, and ears were uncovered. He was about to approach the bed when the nurse said that it was useless. The man was too far gone to be spoken to. He paused a minute. And then decided to leave a text on the bandaged hands. This he did 
without looking to see what the text was. As he was moving away from the bed, a muffled voice said, What's that? Oh, said my friend, it is only a little bit of God's word. What does it say? asked the dying man. Let me see. Yes, here it is. Proverbs 23, 26. It says, quote, My son, give me thy heart. End quote. Who said that? asked the soldier. That is from God's Word, the Bible. Read it again, said the wounded man. My son, give me thy heart. Silence for a moment. And then, did you say that is in the Bible? Yes, and God says it to you. The soldier heaved a sigh. But there was a question in the sigh. My friend waited a moment and then asked what was perplexing or surprising him. Look at the card over my bed, said the soldier. My friend did so and was amazed to read on the card giving his army particulars the name Jack Myson. Jack Myson. Do you say accident? Coincidence? That man was about to pass into eternity. This is Austin Sparks again. And God spoke to him by name. Again, it may not always be in just the same way, but the fact remains that God has a personal concern for each one of us. And a true Christian is one who has come to have such a personal relationship with God as to make it possible for him or her to say, as, as did Paul, He loved me and gave Himself for me. Galatians 2.20 I heard a voice saying unto me, Saul, Saul. Then Saul came to realize that his inner history was all known to Christ. Oh, yeah. The other people could see what was going on outwardly. He was going in hot haste to Damascus. He had certain documents authorizing him to arrest Christians and take them bound to Jerusalem. He was doing his business with a will. And those other people would put it down to his religious zeal. But there was one above who knew something else. He disclosed that knowledge when he said, It is hard for thee to kick against the go. Acts 26.14 So, really, he was like an ox harnessed to a plow, which, unwilling to go in a certain direction, and being goaded against its wishes, was letting out in rebellion and kicking against the goad. What a different picture this was from what others would have had of him. And how different from what he was trying to make himself believe. But that one above knows things that we are not prepared to admit or accept. He sees through us, through all our pretensions and self-deceptions and resistance. Saul was striving desperately to establish the falsehood of Christ and Christianity. But the truth was that he was not so sure of himself as he had hoped. Something had touched him, and it would have been fatal to his position if he had given that something a chance. So he had to gird himself up and resist with all its might, with all his might. Inwardly he was kicking, in effect saying, I don't want Christ. I won't have Christ. I am not going to be a Christian. This is Paul, you know, on his way to Damascus. <laughs> 
Well, Christ is a reality. And sooner or later, sooner, listen, listen to me now. Okay, listen. Well, Christ is a reality. And sooner or later we shall have to have him. There are different times and ways in which that may be. We can have him now as our Lord and our Savior and, like Paul, enjoy a life of wonderful fellowship with him and useful service for him. Or we might have him at the end of our life whether that be sooner or later. But that will mean the unspeakable regret and grief that we have no life of service, service to lay at His feet, an eternally forfeited life of fellowship with Him in the great purpose with which He is now occupied. Or, alas, when this life is past, we shall have to have Him, not as our advocate and friend, but as our judge. God has determined that eventually every knee shall bow to His Son. But His desire is that it shall be as it was with Saul. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? This is what it means to be a Christian. But there is yet more in the words that we have quoted at the head of this chapter. Number two, Christianity is not, okay, Christianity, not a religion, but a person, number two. You know, this is what we tell people a lot, because people say, people say to us, well, what denomination are you, John? Well, Sharon, what, what denomination? And we tell them Acts 5.20, okay, Acts 5.20, that's what we are. And the angel came and got the apostles out of prison and said, Go, stand in the temple and preach to the people all the words of this life. See, Christianity is a life. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ. The person, the man, at the Father's right hand who lives within us. Number two, Christianity, not a religion, but a person. Why persecutest thou me? Asked the glorified Christ. What an idea. Here was a man just going all out in religious devotion, so far as his reason was concerned. Even if his heart had some lurking and bothering question, he was convinced that he ought to do this thing in the interest of religion. He was really a divided man inside, but in his zeal for traditional religion, and as he would have argued for, for God's sake, he was suppressing every question and relentlessly forcing himself on, and yet all the time he was working against God, against God's Son, and against heaven. What a state of confusion. Much could be said about this as to the difference between being religious and being a genuine Christian, as to how it is possible for people to be passionately devout and devoted to what they believe to be of God or for God and yet to be rather obstructing his real interest by that very devotion. <laughs> but we must resolve it all into one inclusive issue. A Christian is not a person who is religious, either more or less. A Christian is not a person who has taken on a lot of do's and do nots. God is not going to deal with us on these grounds. Neither is He going to judge men on the basis of the number or nature of their sins. Okay? End quote. He has one basis of judgment than which any other basis would be unfair. Because everyone, by his or her birth, upbringing, advantages, temperament, and so on would be either favored or otherwise. That one basis of judgment is and will be what are we doing with God's Son, Jesus Christ? Do you get that? I'm going to read that little paragraph again. A Christian is not a person who is religious, either more or less. A Christian is not a person who has taken on a lot of do's and don'ts, do's and do nots 
God is not going to deal with us on these grounds, neither is he going to judge men on the basis of the number or nature of their sins. He has one basis of judgment. One basis of judgment than which any other basis would be unfair, because everyone, by his or her birth, upbringing, advantages, temperaments, and so on, would be either favored or otherwise. That one basis of judgment is, and will be, what are we doing with God's Son, Jesus Christ? God sent His Son, and by Him we are all brought to a common position. He is presented as God's appointed Lord and Savior for all men. God will never say in the judgment, how many sins did you commit? What kind of sins did you commit? But, what did you do with my son? It is not necessary to be violent in our rejection, or actively and vehemently to fight against Christ, as did Saul. We can, with exactly the same eternal loss, just reject him, say no, and close ourselves to him or simply ignore him. We are lost, just the same. There is no need to dash to the ground the saving medicine in order to perish. It is only necessary to leave it where it is and not take it. But it is a terrible responsibility to have known that it was there and to have just failed to take it. Oh, praise God. That reminds me of the story of Elisha and Naaman the Syrian who was filled with leprosy and Elisha said tell you what you do in order to be healed go down the Jordan River and dip in seven times under your with your head all the way under the water seven times count to seven you know and Naaman got all mad and he said no I'm not going to do that I thought you were going to come out and wave your hand over the spot and heal me and so Naaman stormed off all mad and his servant said, Hey man, if he would have told you to do something really hard, wouldn't you have done it? Come on, what's the big deal? Go down and dip seven times. And so he did. And his flesh was like a little baby. Praise God. Hallelujah. So when God tells you, just come to Jesus. Just believe. Come on. All you have to lose is an old nature, old filthy sin nature life that you cannot take into heaven. And if you got all that encumbering you, you ain't going to heaven, okay, when you die. And you don't know when you're going to die. All right? Get right with Jesus Christ today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, finishing up this article, we see then that all questions of life and death, sin and righteousness, heaven and hell, time and eternity are bound up not with religion, church, creed, but with a living relationship to the Son of God. And a Christian is one who has himself come into such a living relationship and has found all these questions answered in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hast thou heard him, seen him, known him? Is not thine a captured heart? Chief among ten thousand own him. Joyful choose the better part. Idols, once they won thee, charmed thee. Lovely things of time and sense, gilded thus does sin disarm thee. Honeyed, lest thou turn thee. What has stripped the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of peerless worth. Not the crushing of those idols with its bitter void and smart, but the beaming of His beauty the unveiling of his heart, who extinguishes their taper till they hail the rising sun, who discards the garb of winter till the summer has begun. 
tis that look that melted Peter. Tis that face that Stephen saw. Tis that heart that wept with Mary. Can alone from idols draw. Draw and win and fill completely. Till the cup overflow the brim. What have we to do with idols who have company with him? That's by Anonymous. And that's the end of the article. And I pray that that blesses some of you. I know it's for somebody out there. And I don't normally read articles by people. But I felt led of the Lord today to read this article to you. I know it was a little lengthy. But you got to understand something. Time is short. Jesus is coming soon. Turn your life over to Jesus today. Come back to the Lord. If you're backslidden today, He will receive you. He says He's married to you. If you will turn back to Him, He will receive you today. Some of you, you know you're backslidden, and I'm telling you, I'm pleading with you to come back to Christ today. Because you might not have another day. You don't know. He loves you so. He wants you so much. He wants you to come to Him today. He wants to pour upon you fresh oil. He wants to put the ring back on your finger today. The ring of the seal of the authority of Christ in your life. He wants to bless you so. Come back to Him today. And be what He's called you to be. Let Him fulfill His purpose in your life today. And if you've never met Christ. If you've never met the Lord Jesus Christ. Come to Him today. He wants to reveal Himself to you. Just cry out to Him with a broken and a contrite heart. And He will meet you. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen.